I normally like to begin uh, with a small check-in. I'm sure some of you came with, uh, with friends. Uh, that's good. Some of you came, some of you may not know the people who are sitting here. And so this is an, a good opportunity for you to uh, to have a to do what I, I, I call checking in. So when we check in, uh, I know we have. Uh, so I always I search on Google uh, for cute animal photos uh, because. Uh, so I think checking in is important. So I think. Just share with each other, I'm going to give you about a minute or two to do this. Just share with each other, how are you feeling now? So what, what is the feeling? Some of you may be feeling tired, some of you may be feeling sleepy, uh, and, and all, all, all sorts of other feelings. How are you feeling as we begin this session? What are you looking forward to? What are you, uh, how has left been? So you can talk about all these things. So I'm just going to give you uh, a, a, probably about two minutes to, to just talk to each other about that. Okay? Just go. <laughs> the readings, the gospel readings from the first and second Sunday of Lent, just to place us somewhere, to give us something to, to think about. So um, I can talk, so the two themes that I felt were there in the first two weeks of Lent were this. The first week of Lent was Jesus, the temptation of Jesus, the wilderness, Jesus going into the wilderness to be tempted. I'm going to talk a little bit about the wilderness. Second one is on life, the transfiguration, the, the person of Jesus and, and who and what this light can mean. Okay. So the first Sunday uh, was on the temptation of Christ. So this uh, because I, I said mass outside of Putin, so I can I can just repeat what I said for my <laughs> So basically it's this, I want us to think about, or rather, I, I felt that it's something that's interesting. Jesus went into the desert, went into the wilderness where he was tempted. We always think, what is wild? When we think about wild, we think you know, wild, wild animals get eaten, you know, all these kind of things. But these days, wild also can mean good, right? You know, you go to the supermarket, huh? rice is, say, rice, then we get wild rice, we get. <laughs> uh, yeah, so honey, uh, then we get wild honey, 25 million. Right? Ah, uh, yeah. Pork, one price. Wild boar, double price. Right? <laughs> so, 
so why would we not be so bad as a lost one? And so when we say Jesus went into the wilderness, could he be going into a place where it's a state of nature? Almost like going back to the Garden of Eden, going, he did not go to the wilderness to get tempted. He was tempted when he was in the wilderness. So him going into the wilderness is him going back to a place where he could be with the Father in a more intimate place. Uh, in the more intimate place. And so the return to the state of nature is a return to the state of grace. Uh, a closeness with God, return. And so for us also, when we think about our wilderness experience, our wilderness experience, could it be a, our experience where we met God in a, in a real way for the first time? For some of us, it could be in church. For some of us, it could be many, many places. So, Lent could be a time for us to go to where that wilderness is, that, that state of grace, that state of experiencing God in a real and intimate way. And the temptation that Jesus had, I feel, okay, this is me, I'm not, 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 I feel that the temptation is to exert our will on God, our will on nature, changing nature into our own image. We are created in the image of God. But when we say we want, we are tempted. So I, I refer this to the to the Gospel of Matthew. The uh, the devil told Jesus, "Look at those stones. You can turn those stones into bread." So the the temptation of taking what God has created and trying to remake it in our own image. So this is that temptation to go to bring ourselves to change that state of grace into something that is. Uh, is, that is not so much a state of grace, a state of myself. So the, the temptation to be selfish, the temptation to move away from God. So that perhaps is a temptation to, to reject. And the theme for this uh, for this uh, this series of talks, so just two of them, is on good enough. So are we turning away from the goodness of God? God created everything that is good. Are we turning away from so that's the first thought about that comes from the first Sunday of, of Lent. The temptation that the temptation to move away from the wilderness, the state of grace. Um, so I I said mass in Kuching on uh, two days ago, so I better not repeat my own thing. <laughs> uh, from, from Sunday but When we talk about light, you know, we always say Christ, we are light. Um, this, what is, do we hold the glory of God? The transfiguration is the manifestation of the glory of God before our eyes. And we are, we are asked to see where God is in our lives. To, to see and to bring that light. We are the light. The light is that we are, we are invited to bring this light out to others. And so the Lord is light invites us to bring this light to others. Light can sometimes be harsh, can sometimes be gentle. Uh, I, when, when I'm at home, I like to have the lights, uh, the, the orangey colored lights, because I find that these, they're a bit more gentle, but I, I hear that they, they may not be so good for my eyes, so maybe that's why it's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's why. But, um, so some, but sometimes you need these, you need bright lights in order to see. I, um, my, my eyesight is not as good as it used to be, and so I realized that uh, the, the brighter it is, the, the less my long-sightedness uh, affects me. So the, even something that is harsh can actually be very, very useful, because light, we need both kinds of light. We need all kinds of light in order for us to encourage, to show the path, and sometimes the light that feels harsh could be the light that invites us to change. You know, sometimes the, the bright light, that invites us to change. That, that is that light that the Lord is shining to us to invite us into deeper conversion. So that's the transfiguration. The Lord who is, who is light, who transfigures, who shows His glory, invites us to, to move towards that glory through our conversion. And so Lent is a time, as we say, it's, Lent is a time, it's a season for us to, to uh, in the words of St. Paul, to work out our salvation with 
fear and trembling. So when, when we think about this, those two things, um, the grace of God, moving towards God's grace and being tempted to, to overcome that, uh, or the light that invites us into, into uh, conversion, we, we're, we're faced with these questions. What do we need to do? Uh, what do we need to change? And what, how are our desires to change? What Do we really want to change or not? Because, you know, every time we, we, we come, uh, you know, we say change our hearts, oh God, come back to me, and all that, then maybe you want to change it, not. <laughs> okay, so we can sing all that, and then it, it feels so nice to sing then after that. <laughs> so, I think the invitation now for us is, how are we going to change? How much do we want to change, and how are we going to change? How are our, I, and I ask that question, how are our desires to change? It's not so much, how much do I want to change, but the desire to change, how is it? So it's not just the, the change itself, but do I really want to change? Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Um, just, I, I, us Jesuits, we go for an annual retreat. We go for eight, an eight-day retreat every year. Uh, it's eight days uh, in silence where we where we pray and we try to listen to to God. Um, it was it was many moments of grace for me, but it was also very difficult. I said, people ask me, "How's your retreat?" I said, "It was good, but it was a bit difficult because I was faced with a lot of things." Where my retreat director finally said to me, "That's your cross, man. Uh, you have to carry the cross, man." Then, uh, so I spent the rest of the retreat sort of. Say, yeah, okay, Lord, um, how am I going to carry the cross? Okay, like you're there, it's not so bad, but then. <sighs> so, the, the realization that it is there and I have to, and it's something that I have to do. Um, that's, that's the desire. My desire to change is to, is to accept that cross, to accept whatever is there in a, in a deeper way to be able to carry this cross with the Lord. So how, so it's good for us to think about this. And so, uh, something to think about. So if these are questions that you can continue to, to reflect on as we go along. How are our desires? What do we need to change? What do we want to change? And so here's the, as I, as I said, I gave you the deal, right? So we can, uh, we, we will be able to talk a little bit about this. Now, I, so when you think about what, what we, changing and state of grace and everything. How good has our Lent been so far? So we've only had about, okay, let, let me try to count, uh, seven, just over 10 days of Lent. We're about, uh, we're about a quarter way through. So it's a good time to think, how good has our Lent been? And I put that in inverted commas. Why? Because the next question, what makes Lent good? Is Lent good because we uh, is it a good length because we, we managed to... I have many stories, and those of you who were with me last year, I have many stories about my, my failures with fasting and all these sort of things. It's, it's, it's quite funny. Um, and, uh, and things like that. So is it a good length that you, you make a resolution to, uh, to abstain or to fast from something and you succeed? Is that good? Is it is a good lens, some a, a lens where we where we convert when we find something that we need to really change in our lives and we manage to change it? Yeah, I think that's probably good as well. Is is it is a good lens where we were able to to hear God more clearly in our lives? That's that's probably good as well. So maybe let's let's take a moment. Let's take a moment. Okay, I'm going to give you three. So. Uh, the only thing that I didn't agree with that is that there's no such thing as excessive hope. Uh, because I think we always hope, our understanding of theological hope is, uh, it's always there, there's no such thing as too much of it. Yet, what they are saying is it's excessive, excessive um, desiring in some way for, for things in, in, in life that we may not be able to, uh, may not be completely achievable. So this is, this is something that is, uh, that is, so with this, uh, Winnicott came up with this idea and uh, there was a, there is an author who wrote a book recently, uh, I'll just show you 
in the book, uh, that really inspired me to, to start talking about this, made me think a lot and, uh, about, how the, about how our spiritual lives can, and our lives in general, can actually be oriented as being good enough. How that's where God, that's where God is. So um, what I'm, what I'm thinking about is for this for, for the next for this session and the next session. Uh, this session I'm just going to be talking more about an introduction to good enough and a little bit about good enough for God. And for next week, uh, two weeks time, we'll be talking more about what it means to live a good enough life. What it means when our spiritual life is good and good enough for God. The book that I was talking about is uh, is uh, The Good Enough Life by Abraham Alter. It's, uh, he's, a, he's a writer and an academic. He teaches writing. And uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful book. It's the first, I would say the first half of the book is really about the, the argument which I was very, very interested in. The second half is no less interesting but it's more about uh, social systems and political systems, which are also interesting, but I, I won't go too much about. So the, the ideas that I'm bringing from the book are generally only from the first part. Uh, just, a, just a note about this this um, uh, this book. I'm not sure whether you've heard, you've seen this before. It's a Japanese art kintsugi, uh, right? Some of you, I right? uh, where you take a broken vessel and you use gold to, uh, to glue it back together. And so it highlights the imperfections while allowing you to see, while, while creating a new work of art that is beautiful because of the imperfections. And I think that's, that's how all of us are. We are beautiful because of our imperfections as well. And so we, we look at this. Uh, I'll start with this when we're talking about good enough. The perfect is the enemy of the good. This comes from a very old Italian phrase, il meglio e il nemico del bene, which means that the better is, the, is the, the enemy of the good. What it means is this, and I, I use that because, uh, not, not to make fun of fine dining, <laughs> you know, sometimes fine dining you have to shift you have to move the, the, the lettuce in order to find what you're supposed to eat. Um, and the, the, the plates are always so big and, the, and the, the pieces of whatever are always so small. <laughs> so, uh, and I almost wanted to put a, a picture of a hawker centre, you know, like, uh, or like, you know, the carpenter street, uh, which are something big bowl. Uh, Sometimes the perfect is the enemy of the good. In, the, the good is something that we, we strive to the good to do to, to do something good. Yet, when we strive to be perfect, we forget about all that is good in the striving for perfection. And the perfection becomes the object instead of uh, instead of the people around us. And so that's why the perfect is the enemy of the good. And I have another example here, and this is from this is from Paradise Lost uh, by John Milton. Um, I'm going to translate that. So, um, so this is the original text by by Milton, because thou hast throw the throne in has the kingdom. Um, <laughs> that's that's okay. This is talking to Jesus. You are in both merit and being the Son of God, and are found worthiest to be so by being good, far more than being great or high, because in you love abounds more than in the world. So, let's look at that. Let's look at that phrase. You are found, Jesus, you are found worthiest to be so by being good, far more than being great. Okay. Anyway, looks 
like it might be in the project then. Anyway, so um, I don't know. It's a project. It's not. Anyway, it's okay. It's good enough. Let's see, right? <laughs> Is, is God. Jesus is great. Jesus is as good as uh, is, is the Son of God. Yet, what this author, what, what John Milton is saying is that the greatness of being God is, we don't look at that as much as his goodness of what he has done for us. And so, that reminds us that we don't have, it's not the position, it's not the position of the power of the person that is that it is the good of the person. It is the person in or herself. That, that is the goodness. That is what we are looking at. And it's, if, if we look at ourselves, it's not where we are going to be or what, where we are, what we are doing, but it's us ourselves, the goodness of ourselves created by God. God created human persons and said it was very good. Created by God in God's image and life. Be, uh, that is our goodness. That is the goodness that we are that we want to concentrate on, not on all these other things. And so th this is where it comes from. The, 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 the beautiful uh, hymn in, in the letter to the Philippians. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, death on the cross. The obedience, the goodness is the obedience, and therefore God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. Jesus, the name above all names. And so, worthiest to be so worthiest, the, the goodness of Jesus, Jesus' obedience, Jesus' humility. And so, that's, that's, where, that's where we want to, to be. And when we think about this, this is, um, this, this provides us a model for us to think about what it means to be good, to, to be humble, to be, to be obedient to God. Not to think about where we can go. Not to think about the, the eventual exaltation. Not to think about the glory. But to think about where we are and our expression of ourselves as children of God. And so, what, what is interesting is this. Uh, what is interesting is this. So, Adam Alpert talks about um, the greatness mentality that's very prevalent in our society right now. So, I uh, have a picture of the great wall, of course. Great man. Yeah. So, um, so, the greatness mentality is, is a couple of things. So, I, I, I'm, uh, I've paraphrased and, and added a little bit. First thing is that success is very important. We must always succeed. That's what the world tells us. Uh, I, um, I always need to make fun of this, so might as well, right? I'm Singaporean, so <laughs> this, this is what we grew up with. You must do great, you must do this, you must, you must achieve. You know, even our national songs, we had achieved. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, you might listen. So, success, we always have to succeed. And if you don't succeed, then then you, you think I am I am I'm, I'm a failure and, and, and things like that. So there is this. That, so that's one. Second one is greatness mentality means being better than others. In order for me to be that to to be to succeed, someone has got to fail. Oh. And I need to get ahead of others. It's okay. I I, I still remember. Um, I, uh, sometime when I was in school, the, the, this idea, my, my, my father's a, a, a maths teacher, so I didn't do very well for one of my maths things. <laughs> and so I, I came back and I showed him, not very good, he said, oh, it's so bad, how can you be so bad? I said, but I'm higher than most of <laughs> Much better. 
my, my phone said, that's not your that's not your capability. That's not the expression of your goodness. And so even though that means that I, I needed to work harder, but it's still it's still that. So that's one point about the greatness mentality. The other thing is um, the greatness mentality, there's this idea of meritocracy that we need to work hard to be better than others so that we can be in charge. And, and, the, and so those who are in charge are the greatest and therefore, and this leads to a lot of problems as well. I am the greatest, I am in charge, therefore I am entitled to... Uh, let's not go further into that. <laughs> so we know where that leads to as well. So, this greatness mentality can lead to, uh, can lead on one end to corruption, the, but it can also lead to us ignoring the goodness in ourselves and chasing after things that are not within us. And think about this in our spiritual lives as well. I chase after the, all these other great things that I think are great for my spiritual life, while I, where, whereas I am not, as, uh, as one of us, uh, mentioned just now, whereas I'm not nourishing my relationship with God, which is the main point of, of our spiritual life, nourishing our relationship with God, seeing the goodness of God, seeing the graces that are there. Instead, we chase after more and more things that may not, so that we can be great. I can, uh, you know, I I say this as, as a joke and uh, so I, I've gone for this course, I've gone for this course, I've gone for this course, I've gone for this course. That makes me, that makes me, that makes me good. But that, that does not mean, a lot of knowledge does not uh, necessarily nourish us as much as us nourishing the goodness, nourishing our relationship and the graces that we have. So that's where the greatness mentality can, uh, can lead to, and it can lead to something else as well. See what that's on time. I'm supposed to finish it next. Okay, so I can Let's play a song. <laughs> it's a very good, it's a very enjoyable movie, but it's also a movie. Um, the songs are somehow very, very apt to describe what, me, what's happening in our society right now. Uh, you know, the, I, I chose that song because it shows that if you're trying to, to, we're talking about the greatness mentality and everything, you, you'll never be You'll never be satisfied. All the stars of the night sky, towers of gold, and it will still be never enough. And as, as it says, I, I like this lyrics, for me. <laughs> it's always never enough for me. So there is that sense, for me. It's, it's not for somebody else, for us and everything, it's for me. And so, I feel that this, that this idea of greatness, thinking about we must be greater than other people, is also a, a movement that talks about selfishness of ourselves. If we want to be greater than others, it's because me, I have to be greater than others. I have to collect all these stars because I need to have more stars than that, that person <laughs> next to me. And so, that's, that's why we want to to be aware of this. So, I'm sure that there are elements of this in all of us. And that's why it's important for us to notice this first. And this is why um, I want to, to talk a little bit about uh, a distinction between what is the, the great versus the good. So, in for, for, for the greatness mentality, it's power and significance. To be powerful, to be important, is, is the most important thing. Whereas, and I'll just go through the greatness thing first. That, um, for, for the greatness mentality, there's a belief that some are better and more deserving than others. There, there, are, there is that. And um, for for those who are thinking about being great, seeking to go one's own way at all costs. Zero sum. Zero sum means that when there is no winner, there must be a loser. 
I win if I, there, there's no such thing as, uh, it's either win, lose, as, if it's a draw, then nobody wins, all right? Whereas, when we think about being good, being good enough, there is this sense of the importance of the goodness and dignity of others, recognizing that there is a dignity to others, and realizing that there is, that, that, that we are good enough. There's a, there's also a reminder of our intrinsic goodness. I, ref I refer to Genesis 1 a lot. And it may be good for us to, um, to, to really re-look Genesis 1, the creation of the world, the creation. Every time God created it, He said it was good. And so everything is created good. And so if that good is not enough, then I don't know what it is. And so when we're talking about good enough, we're not we're, we're talking about that kind of goodness. The creation, the creative power of God and all its goodness, that is good enough for us. And we, that, that makes us happy about being good enough. And so the uh, um, communal being good is also communal goods and the goodness of all remembering that we are a community. And that that, that it's not just um, never enough for me, but there is goodness for all of us. We are not created to be alone. We are created in a community. We are created in the community that is the church. And so we are, we are invited to see this and to see that we are part of that and we are good enough to be part of that community. And so a world that is good enough looks at this, there's, there's uh, the focus on virtue, the focus on value, valuing each other, valuing, uh, valuing others, dignity and sufficiency, the dignity of a human person, the sufficiency, making sure that there is enough for everybody, the good distribution of, of, uh, of, of everything that we have. And the last one is faith and meaning. And I think that is where, that is where it's very, very important for us to really lend when we, our faith, um, the, the meaning that we derive from our practices of the faith allow us to see that all that we, all that we do, all that we are, is good enough. You know, like the, the video that I showed earlier, we don't have to be great people. We are called to be saints. St. Saint Paul says that we are all called to be saints. But a saint is, we are, we are not called to be uh, we're not called to be like some of the other saints, you know, um, uh, thrown off, uh, thrown off high buildings, getting roasted over fire, getting bits <laughs> chopped off, um, and, and, and all that. We, we, we may not be called to that. And, and so sometimes we think, I how to be saint? I, nobody's going to chop my hands off. How am I going to become a saint like that? But, I can be good enough in the situation that I am in. That when I am showing, when I am practicing my virtues, when I am helping to be, uh, to distribute things, when I am helping to, uh, to be a light of Christ in the office to others, just being nice, just uh, uh, bringing snacks to other people, uh, uh, sharing what I have, uh, being just say a, a kind word here and there. These are all things that help us to, to spread love and to show that, yeah, we can be good enough for that situation. We are all called to do great things, but perhaps not yet. Just, just one point that I also made the other day, that um, I think it was last Saturday during the uh, the daily readings for, for Saturday's Mass. It said, be perfect as the Heavenly Father is perfect. Then you look at it, are you <laughs> How like that? Then uh, this is where you go and check. Uh, you check the, the Greek New Testament. The word it does not, it's not actually um, accurately uh, translated into perfect. It's fulfill your life as the Heavenly Father wants you to fulfill your life. To fulfill and to reach the fulfillment of your life. So that does not mean that we have to be perfect. That means we have to be good enough. And so I, I feel that 
Yeah, be good enough as our heavenly Father is perfect. That, that, that's that's what that's what I, that's how I read it. We are not called to be to to we are called to be as perfect as we can, but we, we strive towards that. But we are happy with good enough, and I think that is how our spiritual life can grow. I don't need to I don't need to uh, to be so perfect. I am good enough, and that good enough grows. The goodness grows and gets better. And so this is what the good enough life uh, actually um, means when we think about this. To accept our human beings. We're not as a great life. You know, just to say that, to, to, to acknowledge that we're, we're, we're all, we're all, we all have our frailties, we all have our mistakes, we all make mistakes. It's fine. To, to feel, it's very liberating, I feel. Uh, as, a, as a student who was trying to do well all the time, uh, when, only when I look back, it did not happen when, I, when it happened. The first time I failed the test, it was very freeing. <laughs> I, I did not feel it then. I only, when I look back now, I think yeah, that, that, that it is free. But it is that realizing that we're not that great and we can pick ourselves. Um, from there, the good enough life invites us to be more accepting of other people. If I'm not so good, then I don't, then I don't expect so much from other people also. You know, so, you know, a lot of times we, uh, we say, I, uh, I, I feel very judgmental, but perhaps then we look at ourselves and say, they're not that perfect either, so maybe better not. So we're all fallible too, we're more accepting of each other. And then there is a commitment to each other. That's a commitment to uh, to help others. So this is where I feel the, the start of this good enough life begins. And this you can see is very, very Christian as well. To be humble, to be to be forgiving, and to be uh, to, to be recognizing the the whole community of all of us. We are there. We're not that great, we're all fallible. And this is perhaps one, one way of conversion, one moment of conversion that we can have to help each other. To, uh, to this, this conversion to realize that we try our best and that is good enough. Um, one caveat here is that the good enough life is not saying that we, we lack ambition, we, we're just settling and we're lazy. No. We, we don't. If, if we are thinking, if this, we are doing this, then perhaps that's going down the wrong way. Good enough is not settling for something that is lesser. Good enough is recognizing that we are not perfect and trying our best. And we don't have to try our best until we get so, so, so exhausted and everything. We try and once that is there, like, like what the video said, we don't have to be perfect. But we have to we have to acknowledge God's presence. We don't have to be perfect. We have to recognize that we are good, and that God is there, and that God's goodness is in us. Once we recognize that, that's when we're living a good enough Christian life. So that so what I've been talking about is the good enough life according to uh, people writing about it outside of the faith. But here now we want to think about what it means to live this good enough Christian life. The good enough Christian life that has God at its center and that has God's goodness and our embracing of God's goodness that allows us to meet this life that is better. Um, okay, I put this here to remind myself to, uh, of something. <laughs> I might remember it. <laughs> uh, okay, so I I'm going to give an example here of uh, of, a, of something that I was reflecting about when I was uh, when I was in Chiang Mai. I was in Chiang Mai recently for my retreat. I told you about my retreat, and um, what happened was that I was um, I. I, there was a nearby park that I would go to quite often.
offered. And so I usually went in the mornings. But there was one day I went in the afternoon, and then I noticed that around the park, there were so many people taking photos, and I'm assuming, I don't know, so this is just me being, um, perhaps being a kind judgmental. But um, they, they seem, because it's very, in, in all sorts of different poses, and I, I'm assuming that they're taking photos for the Instagram or for, so they were, they were trying, you know, taking a thing like this from all over the place and everything in different poses, they, uh, you know, wear jacket, take out jacket and everything. So, um, I, I keep perfect love on Instagram thing. So, I, this was a photo that I took uh, of people around us. See, they were around the trees, there were so many. Right behind there was this. It, it, it was so beautiful, but they weren't looking at that. So what, what amazed me was that I was sitting there looking at this, it was so beautiful, and they were just there taking, busy taking photos of everything. And so, um, so that I call this sort of perfection, get this perfect square picture that I can upload to my social media instead of uh, looking at the world. Being good enough, so I, I I'm the kind that I see oh very nice pick up photo pick one photo and then and then I move on because I I take this photo because then I can use it for in occasions like this but it's also memories of of, of that so I I I don't like to take too many photos because I I don't think the phone can take so many photos <laughs> uh, and then after that then your Google will tell you you're running out of space so I think <laughs> so be. But then also, if I keep on taking photos, I'm not looking at the, at, at the, at the scenery itself. So you sit there and look at the scenery, you, you admire this, you, you consider how God is, how God is good. It's that wilderness experience of God's grace in that moment. And that is when you just say, okay, I'll take one photo, that's good enough for me. And so that was my reflection on this as well that good enough opens us to the world. I have a second reflection. So uh, I was rushing to go for, to, to leave, to go for um, to go for my break, to go there. And when I reached the airport, I realized I didn't bring. I normally have a, a watch that records my runs. I didn't bring my running watch. I didn't bring my running watch. So I thought, okay, never mind. Cannot, cannot record my run, so I run slowly along, <laughs> slowly along. You know, normally, then, then I realized, actually when I wear my running watch, it gives me stress. Because I run, I don't know, pace a bit slower. <laughs> and then after that, then at the end, I says, yeah, the, the average pace, not very good. Yeah, maybe not so fit anymore, getting older, is it? So, so then I realized it was free because I did not have that. So I just run, I said, like, if I walk, the pace won't go down there. <laughs> I, uh, so, so, I just, so what I did, so what, it freed me as I was there and I was, I was so much freer to, to really notice everything. He said, if not, I would, what I would normally do is I would, I would set my run and say, okay, today my run will be about this much. I would finish a run, only after I finish a run, press stop there and I would start walking. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, that, that thing, trying to be, trying to be better, trying to be good, was distracting me from the world. So maybe now I will still use that because I think it's a it's a good record to remind me of, of what it is, but I won't use it. I won't I, I'm learning not to use that, not to allow that small little thing to control how I am. And that control how I am, controlling me is the is is me. I mean, who's who am I trying to compete with? Greatness mentality. <laughs> I run so slow. That, so this is this is, uh, there, there was once I, on a bucket list was to do, uh, was to do this uh, solo adventure race uh, in New Zealand. This was before I joined the Jesuits. So I went to, I, I went this, I trained for a year to go. I went there, I, had, I brought some friends over as a support team and everything. I went there and I got 10th wow. from the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> Who ran past me? <laughs> okay lah. After that, good enough lah. <laughs> the experience after, literally 
after that happened, I thought, okay, I'm not, I'm not racing with anybody. Uh, as long as I finish, I get, I get safely to the next point. That, that's fine. And so I enjoy, I enjoy things a lot more. And so that's where we realize that our competitiveness, our thinking that we want to be great for what sometimes, uh, can can distract us from the from what the world actually is. And so uh, that leads us to the last. Um, the last song that it's from, it's the last part of the British Romance. So I to show the one that is uh, never enough, and then here we have this moment of conversion by uh, by Barnum. To give a I I played that because it's a it's a moment of, of conversion. The from the previous time when he was blinded by these lights of the greatness of. Uh, what he could achieve to realizing that it is his family and the thing, the people who are closest to him that you know he said, I drank champagne with kings and queens uh, everybody was there but from now on from this moment now he realizes that it's it's the small things it's the good it's a small goodness that is there that is enough it's no longer a never enough kind of moment anymore and so um, when, when you want to think about Lent that is good enough to be can we can see that um, just just bringing things together for, for today um, you know at the at the start I started with uh, with Lent at the start also at the start of Lent we were reminded about prayer alms giving and fasting in the readings of uh, Ash and Jay. And so what do these, when we think about this, what do these lead us to? Prayer leads us, leads to an increase in virtue. Okay, we, 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 we pray that we, uh, we become better. Arms giving leads us to uh, distributive justice. There it, is, it leads us to a sense of justice. And uh, fasting reminds us of our humanity. Because if you're hungry, you feel very human. Um, and what this also means when we think about this is that good, being good, the goodness leads, is about virtue. Justice is about everybody having enough. And humanity is about leading us life. So the good enough life can be expressed through goodness if we we reach goodness through prayer. Our arms giving ensures people have enough, and our fasting reminds ourselves of our life in God, our life as humans, our humanity, and life in God. And so, when we think about wanting Lent that is good enough, perhaps this is a, this is something that we can think about. How our prayer leads us to goodness. Our arms giving leads us to. Um, to justice and sufficiency and how our fasting can lead us to remind us of that. And the fasting, and as, uh, as Pope Francis always reminds us, it's not just about not eating food. Our fasting can be, our fasting can be fasting from a lot of things that could lead us away from God. And so, um, just a couple of, um, just a couple of things as uh, to, to, to think about as we pray, we seek help in building virtue, reaching out to God who is good. We um, our alms giving is in exercising a commitment to others. We 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 give alms, we help others because we are committed to the life of other people, um, justice to love, and fasting is feeding our humanity, reminding ourselves that we are that we are not that great, but we are good. And there is this sense of humility. I think Lent is a good time for us to remind ourselves of our, our humility as human persons. Humility before God, humility before others. So, um, if we were to, if I were to just, to summarize this is, to seek the good, and if you notice, I put, a capital G here, the good 
that comes from God. We seek the good over that which is great. We are, we are content with God's grace. We remember that God's grace is everywhere. God's grace can be found in the wilderness moments in our lives. And we are reminded, uh, we, we are reminded to reach out to each other. So as we as we go, we 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 think about this and I would I also have the handout. I'm sorry we don't have it now for everybody, but um, that's where that's where technology comes in. Okay. So before we end, um, so so QR code. <laughs> so um, in this in this QR code, it's a Google folder. I hope that we are. It's, uh, it's okay, you can, you can click this QR code and then download whatever is there. There are two things. One is the, uh, one is the, uh, the, is the slides and the other one is the handout. So you can, you can get both. This is a practical method, right? So you can get both and download both and keep that. If you want to distribute this to people who, are, uh, who, you, who feel you may, may find it useful, please distribute it to others as well. Um, uh, just, uh, just a note also on the handout, I just want to uh, this